Hello everybody, I hope this video comes as a nice welcome surprise. Welcome to AP Calculus Unit 1. Now I want to be very, very clear here. For the past year, I covered the entire AP Pre-Calculus course on this channel, and I did this because it was the highest level of math I have ever taken. But now, I have received literal hundreds of comments begging for me to review this stupidly long course. So here I am, only deciding to do 10 unit review videos that are required. Just so you are aware, I have had to teach myself this course to be able to make these videos. So all I ask is, please just follow my Instagram, this took weeks to make, man, please. Anyway, this unit is worth 10-12% to on the AB exam, and 4-7% to on the BC exam. I'll just say, let's get into it already. So I've never really made unit-specific videos before, so I suppose I'll start this simply. What is calculus? It is the study of continuous change. Do you remember back in the first few topics of pre-calculus where we covered rate of change, and I sounded like I was at least two wives in? Well, a lot of that rate of change stuff is similar to calculus with the same formula for rate of change over an interval, and also finding rate of change at a specific point. The big focus of this unit is limits and a new thing called continuity. That means I get to split this video in half, so welcome to the limit part of this video. You might remember we also covered limits in pre-calculus, so why don't we zoom in on what a limit truly is. Let's take the basic graph f of x equals x, and now let's say we have the limit as x approaches 3 of f of x. A limit is simply about approach. It is about, quote, getting close to a number. So on this graph, as x approaches 3, on the y or f of x, we are approaching positive 3. We can take this even further by taking the plus and minus limits. Remember, minus is approaching from the left, plus is approaching from the right. So let's see here. Approaching from the left, we would be approaching 3, and approaching from the right, it would also be 3. But this is a pretty easy example. Now let's do something like this. It is a piecewise graph now. Let's answer the same three limit questions. The limit as x approaches 3 from the left is still 3 on the y, but as x approaches 3 from the right, it is 5. See how these two answers are completely different? That means the limit as x approaches 3 without the plus or minus, just like a girlfriend for me, doesn't exist. This will only happen when these two two are different numbers. But let me ask you a question. What does f of 3 equal now? I mean, yes, we see two places in the y where it is, but one of them is a hole where nothing exists. So the only right answer here is the filled in dot, which is 5. And if you had a graph like this, yes, the limit as x approaches 2 of the function would be 3, but f of 2 would be 5 because that is the filled in point. Now let's move away from graphs. Time to talk about a good friend of graphs called tables. In this case, limits are actually pretty easy to estimate. For example, in this table, it's pretty obvious that the limit as x approaches 5 of this function will be 2. And that's pretty much all I have for tables. Just remember to always round your answer to three decimal places. Um, so, uh... Alright, now I'd like to move to algebra with limits. I kind of relate this to log properties, because you find there will be a lot of similarities between them and the limits. The big foundational property of limits is, the limit of f of x plus f of x would equal the limit of f of x plus the limit of f of x, which would just be 2 times the limit of f of x. These evolve into many other properties that you can try and memorize if you really want to, but I'd rather just do some practice problems. Essentially, the basic thing to know is the limit of a constant is a constant. So the limit of 1 is equal to 1, and the limit as x approaches 3 of 1 billion is 1 billion. So look at this problem, the limit as x approaches 2 of f of f of x. Remember what I said back in pre-calculus, you start from the inside and go to the outside. So as x approaches 2, f of x, or y, would approach negative 1. So now we can fill that in, or if you wanted to do correct notation you can write this, then now we need to find the y value as x approaches negative 1, which is 2. So 2 is our final answer. What about this problem? The limit as x approaches 10 of 1 plus 9 over 3. Solving the parentheses, we get 4. And remember, the limit of a constant is a constant, so the answer is just simply 4. If we were to manipulate this as being the limit as x approaches 10 of f of x plus t of x over 3, where the limit as x approaches 10 of f of x equals 1, and the limit as x approaches 10 of g of x equals 9, the answer would still be the same because we'd just be plugging in the same values. What about if you have a piecewise function here? The way to solve it is by plugging in the limit to each problem. If they match, then that is the answer. And if they don't match, just like my girlfriend, the limit doesn't exist. So now say we have limits but with x's in the parentheses. If you want to solve the limit, the basic method you should always try first is direct substitution. This is where you plug in whatever x is approaching for x in the argument and solve it. A lot of times, 
sometimes though, you will find that sometimes this will create a zero in the denominator if it is a rational function. Obviously, that is undefined, so we need to do something different. So what do we do here? Simple! We use algebra. Foiling and cancelling out expressions, multiplying by the conjugate, factoring, you choose really. As long as you can manipulate the function to where the denominator won't equal zero when you do direct substitution, then it really doesn't matter what you do. Obviously, if nothing works and everything you do seems to only cause a zero in the denominator, then the likely answer is that the limit just doesn't exist. Oh, and there are also these identities you can use for limits. Just remember that these are only able to be used if the limit approaches zero. Let's remember also that if the limit approaches infinity or negative infinity, we have handy dandy tricks for polynomial functions in my pre-calculus 1.6 video, and the handy dandy tricks for rational functions in my pre-calculus 1.7 video. Those videos will both be linked in the description. Now let me introduce you to something that sounds and looks a lot more complex than it actually is. The squeeze theorem. The best way I think I can explain this is with an example. This one. The limit as x approaches 0 of x times sine of 1 over x. Let's ignore the x for a second. From trigonometry, I know that a sine graph falls between the range of negative 1 and 1. Next, if we bring the x back, we now have to multiply the outer numbers by x so we get x and negative x. So now let's write them in their proper limit form, which we do by simply adding on the limit as x approaches 0 to each of them. Obviously, we can't do direct substitution on the middle one because we'd get 0 in the denominator, but we can do it to the outer ones. For both of them, we'd simply get 0. So here is where our squeeze theorem comes in. The idea is that these numbers are squeezing the limit in the middle. If these two numbers are the same, then simply put, the answer is whatever the number is, or in this case, 0. If the numbers are not the same, then the squeeze theorem cannot be used to find the limit. So say that you were given functions to solve for the outer parts of the squeeze theorem to find an inner function's limit. If I were to solve those functions and get different answers, then simply put, I cannot use the squeeze theorem to find the limit. Alright, congratulations! We've now finished with the limits part of the video and are moving on to the continuity part. So the basic definition that teachers give for continuity is that a graph is continuous if you can, with your pencil, trace the entire graph without having to lift it, meaning there is no breaks, jumps, or holes. First, let's talk about the three types of discontinuities. They are removable discontinuity, which is just holes, vertical asymptote discontinuity, and jump discontinuity. I think holes and vertical asymptotes are pretty simple for you to remember how to find. They mostly will all come from rational functions, holes happen when you cancel something out, and vertical asymptotes happen when functions are in the denominator that don't cancel out. Vertical asymptotes can also appear in tangent functions if you remember, and if you want to know how to calculate them, go watch my pre-calculus video, link in the description. And finally, a jump discontinuity is actually pretty simple. This is what it looks like on a graph. Notice how one function jumps to the other one. The way to find this in a piecewise equation is by plugging in the values and the inequalities, and if they don't match, there is a jump discontinuity. Now I want to describe the math definition for continuity at one point. Three things have to be true for one point to be continuous at the point x equals c. f of c has to be defined, the limit as x approaches c of f of x has to exist, and the limit as x approaches c of f of x has to equal f of c. Let's try an example. This piecewise function. Is it continuous at c equals 1? First of all, let's see if f of 1 is defined. Yes it is, because it would equal 1. Okay, next let's check the second one. The limit as x approaches 1. The way we do this is by finding the left and right limits. As x approaches 1 from the right side, we would plug in 1 for this function, and simplifying we'd get 1. Then for the left limit, we simplify this function and also get 1. Because those two match, the limit does in fact exist. Okay, so for the third one, now we need to see if the limit is equal to f of 1. And yes it is, because f of 1 is equal to 1. So yes, this function is continuous at x equals 1. But what if we transition to finding continuity over an interval instead of just at one point? This is where you kind of parallel it with finding domains of functions. Now I'm gonna trust that you know how to find the domain of most functions, as you literally are in calculus. However, I will just offer some friendly advice. Polynomial, rational, power, exponential, logarithmic, and trig functions are all continuous in their domain. Just remember that rational and log functions have domain holes because of asymptotes, along with some trig functions. That means if you find the domain of these functions, which I hope you already know how to, the functions will be continuous with its domain. So that means in most of these questions, the answer is simply the domain. The only place this gets muddy is with piecewise functions, just like this. Obviously, these two functions on their own are polynomials, which would both have domains and continuities of all real numbers. But let's try something here and plug in 1 to each function. Oh boy, 1 is 1, and 1 is 2. That means there is a jump discontinuity at x equals 1. So the way we'd write the intervals where the function is continuous on is by the interval notation we do for domain. Negative infinity 
infinity to 1 with a union and 1 to negative infinity. We don't use brackets anywhere here because we know at the point x equals 1, it is discontinuous. Now let's say we have a question like this. Let f be a function defined by f of x equals x squared minus 1 over x minus 1. What is the value of f of 1 if x is continuous at x equals 1? So your immediate thought here is to expand the numerator. Cancel out the x minus 1 and say there is a whole or removable discontinuity and be done and say f of 1 isn't defined. But that is not what the question asked. The question essentially created a separate realm where the function is continuous at x equals 1. So let's just algebra this out. We cancel out the x minus 1s, then we plug in 1 for x in the function, and we get 2 is equal to f of 1. And that is our answer. And last but not least, I want to introduce you to a theorem you will likely never use but the CED forces me to teach. If your function is continuous on the interval a to b, and your target number k is between the two endpoint values f of a and f of b, then the function must have the value of k at least once for some x between a and b. This is known as the intermediate value theorem, and it has three parts to use it. Number one, you must confirm the function is continuous on the interval a to b. Number two, you must make sure that f of a doesn't equal f of b. And number three, you must check that k is between f of a and f of b. If all of those are true, then the number k will exist within the interval a to b. And there it is, this unit is done. Not too hard, right? I hope this course doesn't get too difficult. But whoa, 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 don't click off the video yet. There's a ritual I like to do at the end of most all of my unit review videos on this channel, and that is asking you to watch this video and subscribe to this channel. It is my non-educational channel for when I wish to move away from all this AP stuff. So please, just subscribe for me, man.